Hello. <laughs> We've got some seats here at the front for the people in the back. You don't want to miss this, so come on in. There's a couple here you can fill out. All right, so this is the Rise Pitch Final. Over the last, well, you know already, but the last few days, 70 of the best startups at Rise pitched their hearts out on our pitch stages in group rounds of the competition. And 10 startups emerged victorious from these groups and pitched on stage yesterday, along with 10 pre-selected semi-finalists. So now three startups are victorious and will, con will now contest the pitch final here on center stage. So this is how the final is going to play out. Each startup will pitch for three minutes only, followed by three minutes of Q&A from our judging panel. The winner will be announced here on center stage at 3.50 today. So before I go any further, just in case you haven't, you've missed the talks from our judges, joining me today we have Hans Tung, Managing Partner of GGV Capital, Anna Fang, CEO and Partner of GenFund, Werner Vogel, CTO of Amazon, and of course, Andrew Connell, Global Head of Innovation and Partnership and Asia Pacific Head of Digital from HSBC. And also, you guys are the audience, you guys are obviously the audience, and you're also going to be part of the judging process. So if you pull out the app, go to More, enter Slido, go to Center Stage, you'll be voting and you will be counted for 25% of the vote. So anyways, let's get up, let's get ready, let's introduce the first startup. The first startup is called RevSmart Wearable. So let's put our hands together and welcome Sunder onto the stage. Thank you. Few years ago, I was on a motorcycle ride with three of my friends to this beautiful hill station. The ride was long and risky. We decided not to wear helmets and use headphones for navigation and music. The journey, which was supposed to be fun, became Devastating when one of my friends met with an accident. Luckily, with timely care, we were able to save him with few minor injuries. But not all riders are so lucky. Every four minutes, a person dies due to road accident in India, and 30% of these are two-wheelers. Helmets are compulsory, but no one really likes to wear them. As riders, we need three major things while riding. Communication, navigation, and music. We do all sorts of things, like put our headphones or phones inside, which can be dangerous. We wanted to build a solution that provides access to these without compromising on safety. Presenting Heads Up, a smart communication wearable for your ride. Heads Up fits on any helmet and provides you access to audio without blocking your ears. Using a unique micro-vibration technology, we transmit the audio through the shell of the helmet so that you can experience audio just like cars. Heads Up connects to your smartphone via Bluetooth and provides you access to communication, navigation, and music safely. Imagine if you could ask your helmet to navigate you to the nearest gas station, and it could do that. Yes, we built a voice assistant that can also alert in case of accidents. Talking about some numbers, the market opportunity is huge, Asia being world's largest two-wheeler market. We are more than just a hardware company. We are already doing pilots with B2B fleet operators so that we can use Heads Up to optimize their delivery. We are also working with insurance companies on how to use Heads Up data to reduce the cost of insurance. All this is possible with an amazing team. Our head of product development has over 25 years of experience in manufacturing, and he's also my dad. I handle the business operations. As a team, we have come really far. We have been chosen as one of the top 10 innovations in India, funded by government of India, Intel, and here in Hong Kong, we are funded by Brink Accelerator. Within just one month of launch, we had 1,500 pre-orders, and we are growing fast. We are here to raise $700,000, which will be mainly used for manufacturing. And for those who are interested and hyped up about buying the product, Please follow us on Instagram. It's Heads Up for Helmets. Thanks once again for this amazing opportunity. I'm open for questions. Do you have a demo of how it works? So, uh, yeah, we can do a demo. But yeah, uh, so th uh, this actually is a variable that just fits on the back of any helmet. And this, there's an exciter module that vib uh, sends the vibrations uh, through the shell of the helmet. So basically, this is like uh, how 
people, uh, the deaf people have this device. It's similar to that technology. The best part about this technology is it can be put on helmets. It will produce this sound. It can be put on this, and this can also become a speaker. So we use this technology to tune over the last two years, and we were doing research on this, which has used the core of this technology. Can you talk a little bit more about the technology and what the barriers are? Yes. Uh, so one of the biggest technological barriers is finding the right materials to tune this for getting the right audio. Because until and unless we find a good quality audio inside the helmets, riders won't choose this. They will always prefer the in-ear experience. So we did a lot of research on what kind of tuning has to go into it, and also the connectivity part. Because riders, when they ride, they need to communicate to the other riders that it's a very important part of safety. Mm -hmm. So this is also something we have developed over the years. And uh, we use some of the Intel score technology in it, where Intel supported us with funds and technology. Yeah, so the biggest challenge there, I think, is still you have your cell phone involved in all of this. Yes. Uh, yes. And so it's not a bi-directional communication, is it? Yes. It, uh, this is currently related to the cell phone, so you have to connect it to the Bluetooth. Yeah. We didn't want to make the device look too bulky, though that was one of the reasons we wanted to use the cell phone, so that it's dependent there. So if you talk about communication between riders, how do they communicate back? I mean, there's no yes. voice interface there. So what we did was we created kind of a, similar to WhatsApp voice chat, we created an interface. So before riding, you just click start ride and add the members of the group. So once you click connect, everyone is connected over intercom over LTE. So it's like similar to voice chat, how you do in WhatsApp, so you can just talk and they can listen. So that's how we evolved. So where, where's the microphone? Sorry? Where's the microphone? So microphone will be inside here. Oh, there'll be a, yeah, there'll okay. be a wireless microphone, which has noise cancellation and air cancellation, so that you can listen to uh, commands, personal com uh, assistant commands, like you can say, hey, heads up, and things like that. How easy is this to like, yourself install it? What do you have installed for people? So we don't, it's a very simple installation. They just have to just tuck. It's like a tape they use in regular devices. They just stuck it here and stuck it here. There's no wires inside, which causes irritation for riders. And what, if, what kind of consumer research have you done in terms of the price point that people would yes. uh, do this? Because it's cheap to have a little earphone, yes. right? So one of the biggest problems we faced was in the... So we, we started with a 300 uh, rider community where we were trying to do a lot of research on what they like and what they don't like. And when we did that, the most alternate products today are European, which cost like $5.99 or $3.99, which riders have to wear. So we were trying to take the price point down, at the same time provide value. The biggest problem today is when we did the research of price point, people are ready to pay value, uh, pay for value of this product. Like headphones, when you use, it's irritating. Like I have tried headphones myself as a rider. It pains after like two hours of uh, wearing for a long time. This does not do, uh, do that. It is very clear and very, we did some rider tests too in India, which was pretty brilliant. But how many people would, what will they pay? Uh, yes. Uh, so what's the so, second yeah. size? And so right now in the market, this is the cheapest product which can be provided to the Asia. So we built completely for Asia because all the products in the market is $299. Uh, so this is right now, we, we benchmark where we, we took the survey, it was $80 to $129 was the benchmark because people who buy bikes for like $2,000, they can spend like around $100 for an additional product that can make their life easier. So you, th you see this as a premium product for a high, yes, it's the high end of yes, the biking Yes, yes. yes okay. it's a sub Great. Thank you very much. Round of Thank applause you. for Rev Smart. Great start to the pitch. Let's welcome up now Ben to the stage who's represent representing WePloy. Hi there, all good day. Uh, my name is Ben and I'm the CMO of WePloy. And what we do is pretty simple. We help businesses be more agile by connecting them to pre-vetted temporary staff. So customers can log onto the platform and jobs are connected to staff based on skills and capability. Meaning that the hiring manager saves a lot of time but also gets consistent quality. Now that's just a lot of words, so what does this look like in real life? Well, this is one of our Cathy's from Lonely Planet, one of our customers. So Cathy was coming into work one morning and she got a phone call from her receptionist saying she is unable to come into work today. Now, Cathy knew what this, happened, what, what this happens next. She'll have to go through a pretty tired process, reaching out to some recruiters, getting some CVs, and she knew at best she might get someone into the office around midday. Until then, one of her customer service team was going to have to come in and man that front desk. 
Luckily for Kathy, she had been recently introduced to Weeploy and decided to log on to the platform. So this is what it looks like from Kathy's perspective. Once logged in, she put some details around the job, start date, start time, dress code. We've really tried to make sure this form is as intuitive as possible. From there, she goes through and selects the core skill, in this case, receptionist, and then adds in any more details about the job. From there, she goes through to checkout, and then it's immediately pinged out to all available Wii employees in the area matched against that skill. It's pretty easy for a Wii employee to accept. It gets pinged out to their phone. They can look at that job. If they're available, it's a simple slide to accept. But what does this really mean? Well, Kathy got that call at 7.30 in the morning. By 7.31, she was able to post the job on platform. And just 33 seconds later, that job was filled. And so at 9.04, when Kathy got in the morning, Audrey was sitting at the front desk. And this is an actual picture of Audrey at reception at Lonely Planet. And we're able to provide the speed and the quality due to our vetting process. So every employee has to go through this in order to be accepted onto the platform. And this is a direct quote from Kathy. I will never use an agency for these types of roles again. And this holds true to this day. So looking at traction, we've been around in market for around 12 months, currently in Sydney and Melbourne. We've gone from five to 26 employees. We've seen double digit growth month on month, which has meant in the first year, we broke through a million dollars in revenue. We are a marketplace. So looking at the supply side, our average time to fill a job is 11 seconds. We have over a thousand employees active on the platform with an average star rating of 4.87. And this just shows some of the companies that have adopted us. <clears throat> a wide range of industries, both large and small from startups through to big multinationals. Thank you very much. My name's Ben, and uh, I hope you can join us in building more empowered and fearless future of work. Questions? How do you get people to take the tests? We, we haven't had too much problem. We find the most easiest channel is actually referrals. So once a Weeploy is on the platform and using it and getting work through it, then they refer their friends. And that's probably one of our most effective channels of getting um, candidates. It is an automated process. So once they apply, we've tried to stream us as much as possible. So it's automated. They get um, uh, initial sort of review of their application. And then they get sent the links um, to the the, the tests that we do. Um, and then from there, we have a final face-to-face -face over video just to sort of confirm a few things. Um, but the supply hasn't been too much of an issue. Um, it's actually sort of matching the supply and demand, being a marketplace. That's always the, the toughest thing. Um, but we've, uh, we've got some pretty good processes in place to manage that. What happens if it goes wrong and the, it doesn't work out or the employee doesn't turn up? Or So we have a guarantee. Um, so we put our money where the mouth is, basically. So if in, within four hours, if the Weeploy is not working, they're not the right fit, um, then we will replace them for free. We do examine that a lot because we've had a few cases where the Weeploy hasn't been quite right, and that's, that's people. We can't manage that. We've also made sure we investigate it because sometimes we've seen that the employer actually might be discriminating against the Weeploy. So they are an employee of us, and so we really investigate all those situations. This uh, used to do it be the domain of the Ronstads and, and other employment agencies of this world that also give you the same employee on the same day, a new employee on the same day. Um, how, what differentiates you from, let's say, the traditional players in, in the immediate staffing world? The speed is one. They cannot match it for the speed. Um, so at best, four to six hours if you need someone immediately. <coughs> um, it's the, also the vetting, the consistent quality. So. Everyone goes through, we look at sort of three, well, there's actually six different factors, but they sort of fall into learning agility, custom orientation, and action orientation. Um, so we're able to provide a consistent quality for business support and admin functions. That's really the main differentiator. Do you, do you train them a little bit on specific sectors or just general behavior? No, based on... Um, they, once they go through the vetting, when we go through the psychometrics, um, we have a pretty good understanding and the face-to-face. -face. So we only accept the people that we think are going to be um, good on the platform. Um, and we look at their career history. So that's how we tag their capability and skills, based on what they've done before. So if they've done a lot of work in finance admin, we'll tag them for that finance admin skill. Customer service, the same. So what, what is the thing that really limits you to scale? Is that the number of workers that you can sort of find over time? Yeah, um, probably that is going to be the one of the scaling factors. Um, as I said, there's, there's, 
the markets that we go in, there you have to sort of have the right market conditions in terms of supply. Um, we haven't found supply as being a critical uh, uh, inhibitor of scale right now, um, and potentially that's where the markets we're playing in, but we've got some ideas around how to sort of scale it out. Okay, Are you doing this city by city, or is it more complicated than that? It's city by city. Okay. Yeah. So right now, Sydney and Melbourne, we're looking at Adelaide and Brisbane based on some strategic conversations we're having with other partners um, to scale that out. And then we're looking internationally, hence why we're at Rise. And I noticed that you have Slack as a customer. Yeah. What, what kind of work do you do for Slack? So um, they've done some receptionist roles. They've also done some data. Um, admin data entry, that sort of thing. In fact, one of our employees, um, Patricio, is actually a, uh, a full-time employee there. So they bought him out um, from the platform. He was actually a pool boy before. Um, and I think on his LinkedIn profile, it says, from the pool to tech. And uh, it's one of our success stories, anyway. Excellent. Great. And the round applause for Reploy. Thank you. All right, judges, write down your uh, score on that one. While we welcome up the third and final startup today, it's called Lodgevan. Hi, we are Lodgevan, Uber for trucks in Vietnam. When you look around, everything has been delivered by a truck. This is why in Vietnam, the trucking industry is a multi-billion dollar business, growing at 14% annually, with over one million trucks. But the Vietnam's long-haul trucking industry is extremely fragmented, with over 90% of trucking companies have less than five trucks. And the capacity is underutilized, with 70% uh, truck empty return rate. This leads to very high logistic costs, accounts for 23% of our national GDP, compared to Singapore only 8%, or China only 15%. At Logivan, we want to solve that fragmentation problem by aggregating trucks and freight onto one central platform. We match shippers with truckers with transparent fees, so shippers can enjoy better choices more convenience and reliable shipments. For everything fully insured, and uh, the drivers are pre-verified. Truckers, of course, can increase their income, pay less commission to brokers, and increase, uh, expand their businesses to more trucks. There are many ways that we can diversify our revenue streams. First is commission on shipments. The second is selling trucks and auto parts on our platform, selling insurances. And by collecting data about our truckers, we can assess their credit risk and offer loans such as truck loans and payday loans. So since launching five months ago, we have now have over 4,000 truckers onto our database and over 600 shippers. And our cumulative uh, GMV has exceeded $1 million. This is the team behind the dream. I'm Ling, and I'm the founder and CEO. I used to be at Cambridge, Goldman Sachs, and I also own 10 trucks. And our sales lead have had more than 10 years' experience at DHL, and our product lead have more than 12 ex years of experience at FPT. Our investors is Yin Lan Tan from Insignia Venture Partners, and our uh, advisors include Uber Freight Directors and from Manban Group, which is the largest truck platform in China right now. Okay, so to wrap up, we are looking for strategic partnerships and investors to expand to other Southeast Asian countries. And uh, please remember, if you bought it, a truck brought it. Thank you very much. So what happens with the freight right now? Sorry? I mean, before you were there, there were still these freight still needed to be moved. Yes. How did they match up with the truckers? Uh, so shippers have existing truck vendors. They have about five to uh, six truck vendors. And when they need a truck, they con contact these truck vendors. And then they wait until and then the truck vendors come back with quotes. And then they decide who to go with. OK. Yeah. So that's something you uh, eliminate now. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. As your one, why did you want to solve this particular problem? Yeah. And um, uh, two, as you're growing, what are some of the challenges, uh, bottlenecks that you see as you grow, as you scale? Yes. So the reason why I started Logivan is because my family business have 10 trucks. 
and by observing that our trucks often returns empty, up to like 90% of the times. This is why I looked into the trucking market, and I see this is a bit of a potential for, uh, for, for disrupting. And the, one of the you know, major challenges is, of course, uh, you know, user behavior, educating the truckers about the new innovative platform, which they previously relied on their local contacts, the existing brokers that they know of. Yeah. And what are the challenges that you face as you scale the business? The challenge is that uh, it's working capital. Yeah. <laughs> Have you met uh, Wang Gong before, the CEO of the uh, largest player in China? Uh, I haven't had a chance to meet him, but maybe you could introduce me to him. We'll be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> invest in her first. <laughs> um, we'll be happy to. Thank you. Happy to invest in her? And uh, make introductions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what kind of efficiency are you seeing with the trucks efficiency. through your platform? Like uh, capacity, I mean efficiency, use. Right. Uh, so now we are doing intercity. So intercity is more like last mile delivery players like Ninja Van, GoGo Van, and that's very bloody. What we are trying to solve is like further up the supply chain, the first and middle mile delivery. And it has more margins and it's make up the, the larger trucking industry. Um, sorry, the question is... Like before you said it was like 90% empty, right? So if yeah. the users presumably, they're full more, yeah, right? Yeah, right now we uh, have more trucks. And so, um, you know, we put our 10 trucks in. Okay. Um, yeah. Which other Southeast Asian markets do you think are similar to Vietnam? Because it's, it is particularly fragmented in Vietnam. Uh, similar to Vietnam because Vietnam is single landmass, so Thailand would be very similar, Cambodia, right? And Indonesia, the Philippines, they are more uh, like uh, islands, so uh, they rely on ferries as well. So, but the Philippines is very interesting. Uh, Indonesia, this uh, the single largest island, Java. And yeah. do you see the same fragmentation of the trucking industry in those markets? Uh, in the single landmass countries, yes. But for um, kind of Indonesia and the Philippines, for example, they have islands. And so the trucking companies are more like corporates. So they have like 20 trucks or something. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Lynn. A round of applause. Thank you. All right. Keep it going. Thanks to all three of the finalists. Right now, we're going to let the judges take some time to collect and count their responses. Of course, please use the Slido to vote for your favorite one. And we'll see you at 3.50 back here where we announce the winner of Pitch 2018. Thank you. <clears throat>